Hey there, and welcome to episode number four of the World of Presentations podcast brought to you by 356 Labs. Today, we are talking to a very, very special guest whose name is Chase Hughes. Chase is the CEO of Applied Behavior Behavior Research. After 20 years in the US military, he is now the leading expert in behavior profiling, influence, and interrogation. He teaches the most elite government and business teams in the world and is also the author of the number one best-selling book on persuasion, people reading, and influence. The book is called The Ellipsis Manual. You'll find it in the show notes after this podcast. Chase, thank you for accepting our invite and welcome to the show. Thanks, Boris. Glad to be here, man. Yeah, it took us, it took us a while, I think more than a month. Maybe even more. Yeah, maybe even more. <laughs> we, we went through a couple of trials. <laughs> we did. Yeah, let's put it this way. And we actually started discussing this podcast way before, I think, the COVID-19 situation. Correct me if I'm wrong. but I think you're right. I think it was before. Yeah, I think it was before that. And the reason how all of that happened was very interesting too, at least for me. I listened to a podcast uh, uh, to a podcast episode with you and Mark Bowden, who was part of our podcast before. You said some really crazy things in that podcast that I hope you at least at least some of them repeat now. But while I was listening to to all of those, you added me on LinkedIn. That was <laughs> very 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 strange. I don't know if there is anything related to your trainings or anything related to your expertise here on influencing all of those things. <laughs> but anyway, and that's why I immediately decided that if it is possible to have you on the show, it will be really, really fun. So again, thank you for, thank you for being here. So where Brilliant. do we... My pleasure. So where do we start? Like your experience, maybe can you kind of give us a brief, brief intro in regards to your experience because i believe your experience is like mind-blowing so can you just say a few words in regards to your previous experience because before the before the applied um before the current the current company so i i did 20 years in the u.s military and i became obsessed with human behavior when i was probably 19 okay and it was it all was because somebody a, a young lady turned me down for a date one time. I, I went home that evening, almost 25 years ago, 22 years ago, okay. and typed into Google how to tell when girls like you. Okay. And I got obsessed with reading behavior and reading body language because the more I was able to do this, I, I could see fear and insecurity and uncertainty in, in so many people who I thought were very confident and, and very self-assured. And I think over time, the, the reason that it became addicting for me was that it made everybody more approachable, more human, easier to talk to. Okay. And after, after a while, you know, I, I went to college for psychology and found myself working in, in intelligence operations for the military. My last several years in the military, I was the captain of a small spy boat, like a, an assault and a spy boat doing sneaky stuff. And, okay. and I, uh, I became obsessed with not, not only human behavior, but influence as, a, as, a, yeah. as an art form. And not to the point where, you know, it's like how to win friends and influence people. You shake somebody's yeah. hand, give them a firm handshake, use their name, look them in the eye. But these are still the basics that everyone needs, right? Sure. The Dale Carnegie things, okay? Sure. Because these are like levels, I imagine, at least in some type of a hierarchy, you have to start from somewhere, right? Right, right. Yeah. And, and I was obsessed with, with the far end of it. How, how far can a person be pushed and what, what can a person be made to do? And then I wanted to find okay. the wall and like, where's the, where's the end of limit, persuasion? Yeah. yeah. And then if we have a limit of how much somebody can be made to do, I tried to find how fast we could make that happen. Okay. Makes sense. So in an interrogation room, uh, I, I, I'm obsessed with, as far as interrogation goes, 
how can I get somebody to do something that might not be in their best interest, which is confessing to a crime or providing vital intelligence that could get yeah. them killed for revealing. So how can I do that and go all the way to that extreme in a very short amount of time? And I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I had developed a system of persuasion that wasn't just interrogation. It was applicable everywhere. Yeah, And okay. that's what was fascinating to me. And I had never planned uh, to teach this stuff as a, as a career. And it turns out to be a, a, a profoundly uh, powerful system. Yeah, I think that a lot of people get, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of people are interested in the topic, especially in the last few years, influence became like, at least in my opinion, became a very hot topic in the overall, in the society in general. But uh, at least that is my understanding. I don't know if it's, if that is the same thing that you are seeing on your end, but correct me if I'm wrong here. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's got to be more powerful. And yeah, yeah. nowadays, you know, the, 50 years ago, a person's attention span was like 45 minutes. And today, uh, the average <laughs> attention span is less than one minute. And yeah. if we're communicating to people, uh, if I'm speaking from the stage or if I'm presenting to an audience, even though they're not holding their phone, I am still competing with Instagram and Facebook and social media yeah. because they're not, they're not checking their phones, maybe, hopefully, yeah. but I'm still competing with their brain that's used to being able to scroll past anything that's not really entertaining and that captures all their yeah. focus. Yeah. Yeah. So you said that you said that you started delivering all of those trainings, not only for the U S military. And we know that I for sure will link in the show notes to the um, a library of online courses that you guys produced. How many courses are there? Like, I think I saw like 10 or something. Yeah, I think we have 10 or 11 different courses that, that people can take online from the basic introduction okay. to a, a, a program that lasts an entire year. Yeah. Give somebody some mastery over the over the topic. Yeah, that, that will be a very interesting one to go through, I think. Okay, so we are going to for sure link in that one uh, to that one in the show notes. However, the people who are going to listen to this, I told you before we started all of that, uh, are people who are presenting, they're just starting to present or yeah. they're now already quite successful in their presentations and are now seeking to go to the next level, right? They're yeah. from there. You can imagine that the audience here is from students to C-level executives. How do, where, if we have to start from somewhere, having in mind your experience, and having in mind that you are delivering a lot of trainings, you have built a lot of training programs, went on a top, like hundreds and hundreds of stages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If we have to start from your experience, what are the what are the things that those type of people need to know or need to consider before I ask you about the my friends John technique? So, uh, are, are you wanting a couple of tips and techniques for the speaking world? Yeah, for example, let's start there. Sure. So I started, I've, I've been on thousands of stages, but when I started, I had no experience in public speaking at all. Okay. Yeah. So I had watched, I probably spent 50 hours watching YouTube and I would watch really good presenters, people like Mark Bowden, who, who does yeah, a Mark is... fantastic job of, of talking. Yeah. He just captures people's focus in a way that I had never seen. And so I would just copy those people at the beginning okay. until I yep. found my own voice. And yep. then I realized I can use my behavioral profiling skills as a speaker. And one of the cool ones that I thought as I got better at this is that there's something called blink rate. And blink rate. Okay. Blink rate. And this is just how often a person blinks. And we okay. can measure that in number of blinks per minute. Okay. And the average blink rate of most people in a conversation is like 15 to 20 times per minute. Okay. And the more stressed or disinterested a person becomes, the higher their blink rate is. And okay. So, for instance, like the last time you took an exam in college that you really didn't want to take, 
your blink rate was probably around a 70, 70 per, per minute. minute. Okay. And that is the last way time, more. Yeah, it's huge. And the last time you watched a movie that had complete capture of your focus, like it was really you interesting. You didn't blink at all. <laughs> yeah. Our you didn't blink, blink rate, at all. Yeah, our blink rate's around a three per minute. Really? Okay. And it's a, it's a drastic shift and it's really easy to spot. So think about okay. this though. No one is ever really aware of their own blink rate. It's That's not something true. we pay attention to. So since we're not aware of it, it's an unconscious indicator that's 100% almost reliable. Yeah. So you would, as a speaker, myself, I'm looking around the room, making eye contact with different people for three or four yeah. seconds at a time. Yeah. If, if I make eye contact with these people and I'm watching how fast they're blinking, I can get the blink rate of the room as a whole on average. So I know okay. that if I'm doing my job correctly as a speaker, and if I want to get the actual number, I just look around for 15 seconds, count the number of blinks, multiply that by four, and that's, you know, that equals 60, 15 yeah, times. Yeah, which is a minute, yeah. Yeah, which gives us the blink rate, average blink rate of the entire room. If it starts speeding up, I know as a speaker, I need to change the pitch of my voice. I need to walk to the other side of the stage or I need to change the topic. I need to regain focus. Yeah. And I swear to you, that's one of the most valuable things I've ever learned as a speaker of using my own behavioral profiling techniques. Yeah, that is. Because I haven't, to be honest, sorry to interrupt you here, but it's just fast, it is just fascinating. You promised that you're going to say something really interesting. I would kind of, if I have to go and say, hey, uh, how much do I know the world of presentations, etc.? I would say that our company in total knows a lot because we have been involved in really critical things, executed them very successfully, etc. I even I haven't thought about blink rate. That is, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is. However, I have a question here because many people now we see another problem with potential problem with that one. Let me tell you what is it. That is fascinating per se. However, have you noticed that if you train people recently or if you receive that feedback recently from somebody of your students, have you noticed that people or at least the people that we work with most of the times, they don't rehearse their presentations? And what you say, I think, correct me again if I'm wrong, but if I am there, I try to imagine myself doing this. If I try to do that in a stage, from the stage, I need to be extremely present and prepared so that my focus as the speaker goes to monitoring the blink rate, right? Otherwise, if I'm wondering how should I speak, what is next, how, where am I on my slides, etc., I have no chance of also trying to keep up with the blink rate, right? Or any other thing. Yeah. So any, any speaker should be well, well trained in what they're speaking about. Yeah. Because otherwise, how are you going to do that? Like you, your presentation has to be, you have to be very well prepared in order for you to have the capacity to monitor for that. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of mine, I'm, I'm teaching for nine hours a day for five days yeah. on stage. Yeah. 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 And I would say if, if you need slides or you need notes, then that's a big problem. Okay. That we, we really need to master our craft. And the moment that we communicate uncertainty or doubt to yeah. our audience, yeah. we've lost them. We've yeah. not just lost their attention. We've lost our own credibility. Yeah, trust. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, the blink rate is not something you have to count. So yeah. what, I'm, what I'm looking for around the room, if I'm, if I'm really concentrating on something else, is the blink rate speeding up or slowing down? Is it fast or slow? That's it. Okay. So just that one tip can really let you know. And okay. the moment that we see something that causes any kind of discomfort or disagreement, uh, we need to change the topic or we need to maybe backpedal a little bit. And, oh, and Yeah. But the, the, now I'm thinking about this. this the, that also applies to when there is a question from the audience and you respond. Right, the way you respond and how the other person perceives your answer through the blink yeah. rate, you can understand how he or she is thinking about it. I yeah. think. 
give you a, at least give you clues, right? Yes. And and I would say just on that topic, I, I would yep. if you're a speaker, never answer a question from the audience without getting that person's name. Okay, that is why. Why would you say that? So that way, we're we're not only developing rapport with that person, but we're okay. showing that we care who we're speaking to. So if somebody raises a question and they start asking, you say, "Sorry, what's your name?" And we get their okay. name. And if the question is good, I run off the stage and shake the person's hand. Okay. I run down okay. into the audience. I shake their hand. I tell them, I've got, a, I've got a really cool gift for you after this. Please come see me. That way it encourages other people to engage, to ask a little bit more questions. Okay. But it's important to notice like a sign of discomfort that everybody, anybody that's listening right now needs to look for is people uncrossing their legs. If you see more than one person uncrossing their legs at the same time, something has caused discomfort in the audience. And if you see audience squeezing their lips together, I know we're not on a digital yeah. or on a video here, but just pushing the lips together like a tight lip smile almost, like yeah. the lips are squeezing together, that is yeah. unconscious disagreement. Yeah. So that's something you need to at least pay attention to the people in the front row so you get a good feel for the rest of the audience. Yeah, so blink rate, squeezing your lips, seeing people who... Yeah, who go and cross or uncross their legs is something that is some, these are unconscious signs that you have to be really aware of, right? Just to wrap yes. them up, up until here. Okay, that is, that is cool. By the way, just one question here. I always thought uh, like what you said about when someone has a really good question, you jump from the stage, go to this person, uh, shake hands, etc. Have you tried this? Because I'm kind of curious, you know that there are, differences in regards to the u.s audience the european audience on and on and on um uh, have you seen that and have you tested that and do you see it working also in europe the the one with you going from stage to shake the person ha uh person's hat, hand hand etc yeah. is it working okay cool. i i uh i think it, it absolutely does because if okay. i'm on stage and this is just from my perspective, but sure, 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 yeah. if, if I'm on stage, they know there's an American up there and they know he's yeah. going to act like an American. So okay. it's already expected. And if it's obviously, if it's not okay in that culture, then I wouldn't do it. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah. But I will thank them very, very graciously. I will thank them for the awesome question, make sure I have their name and then say, hey, please come up and see me after this. I'd like to give you a gift. Yeah, and that would be okay. a copy of my book, or of you know, a, a, something for free training or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What else do you What else do you monitor for when you are on stage already? Like, is, are there anything else that you are kind of on the on the look for when you are on the stage, except for those three things? Yeah, Obviously, if I there see, may be a lot, but what else? If I see a bunch of people taking notes, I will I will just stop. Okay. And I will let them take notes. And if okay. you think about when you're speaking from the stage, from a psychological perspective, nobody in the audience processes, fully processes what you're saying until you stop talking and pause. That's true. Yeah. And there's a lot of reasons that people will stop listening and you'll lose them. And if they feel like they've heard the message before, you're done. If they feel like they know the outcome of what you're going to say, you're finished. And if something is boring or too wordy or something else around them, like a like an Instagram notification on their phone is more exciting, yeah. then you're done. Then you lose yeah. the game. Yeah. And a lot of times uh, in in regular conversations, you know, some people are waiting to talk, but in in a public speaking environment, we don't really have that, which is great. And a, a lot of people get complete loss of focus when people use too many words like fluff words just to explain a simple idea they use 500 words when 20 yeah. words will do just fine yeah and one of the the biggest things i want to talk about here or i, I would love to share with your audience that the the reason we make decisions as an audience uh, the reason that your audience is going to make a decision to do something is based on the mammalian brain. It's the, yep. the, the mammal brain. That's like, if you put your fingers in your ears, 
that's where that part of your brain is. Yeah, when I heard that explanation from you, just put your ear, <laughs> uh, put your fingers in your ears and you, you point to it. I was like, that is how you explain something complicated in a simple way. Like, hands, like, that was great. That was, I think I heard it with, in your conversation with Mark. I don't know, but that was super cool. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. It's just really fancy, really cool stuff. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, that uh, if, and one big thing is, is telling people versus showing people. Okay. And if we're telling people things, we're not triggering the animal part of the brain. We're only using language. That middle part, the animal part of our brain is yeah. not capable of language. That's yeah. a higher brain function feature. Yeah. So to yeah. talk to the animal brain, we have to show it images. We have to make the top part of our brain, the human part of our brain, yeah. communicate a vivid image down below. So like if somebody says, I was stressed, that doesn't, yeah. that doesn't give us an image. So yeah. instead of like, hey, I was really stressed out the other day, we say, my fist were so clenched up, I was just fidgeting, my shirt started soaking in sweat. Yeah, you describe it. Yeah. Right? You so I say it. like, instead of the room was messy, you can say, I walked into the room and saw clothing covering the floors. There were dirty plates and cups littering the top yeah. of like every flat surface in the room. Yeah, you, ex you, explain the, you explain what you have seen in vivid, with vivid kind of words so that people can paint the picture in their brains. So true. Yeah, and, okay. and without telling them what you're telling them. Like if I want to say that a woman was confident, I wouldn't say that she was confident. I would say she strode into the room and everybody turned to look. Yeah. You know she was confident. And then yeah. not just do you know she was confident, you know that she was probably powerful, you know she was probably beautiful, you know you you have an image in your head of that. If I you say you can imagine a person like yeah. that, right? Yeah. So easier and so much easier to imagine. So like yeah. it, and just in the work environment, like I speak to a lot of companies. Somebody says, oh, the employees there are really happy. That doesn't do anything for me. Mm. So when we could say, you know, I walked into that building and I noticed everybody smiling. People were walking really tall. and Everybody seemed to have a fantastic relationship with each other. Yeah. And I've, I've never I've, said the employees yeah. are happy, but you knew it. Yeah. 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 That is very interesting. I read, um, uh, I recently read... I believe his name is Kendall Heaven. Correct me if you know that name. I believe he is, uh, his name is Kendall Heaven. He has a book on storytelling though. Uh, and he talks about the so-called neuro story net and the sensory details. And what you are saying here is just so, so similar in regards to the sensory details, how you use words to yeah. kind of explain to people what the person has seen, how does that made them feel what they have heard, et cetera, et cetera, right? To attack the senses of the person through words so that you provoke emotions in the other audience, in the audience and make them paint the picture. That is, yeah. at least correct me if I'm wrong with this one. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's so true because we are not just painting a picture to make our story vivid. We're painting a yep. picture so that the mammal brain understands it because yeah. You know, when you go, uh, you the last time you went and bought a new laptop or a, yeah. a new TV, we think in our rational brain, they're like, oh, I did the research, I checked the pricing, and I <laughs> did all this yeah. stuff. But in reality, our mammal brain makes those big decisions. And our mammal brain is what drives our focus. And if we have focus, then we're talking to the mammal brain, and we're yeah. able to communicate in, the, in that imagery. Yeah, so that is why we take decisions. People like to say, hey, we take decisions based on emotions, but we support them with the data, right? Yes. But when we take decisions, it's all based on emotions and that mammal brain, and that's why we cannot explain it, right? We say that uh, we, we b uh, bought something, but we cannot explain why, right? We just cannot find the words because that part of our brain does not support that function, right? As, as you said at the beginning, it just doesn't have the, it doesn't have language capabilities. Yeah. Right, at all. That is, I, yeah. Every single time when 
I don't know when all of this started, when all of that research in regards to the human brain and we as humans understanding how we work started. But I believe that every now, every every day nowadays, you find more and more research that's trying to explain how we function, right? And how we work and why we react in the way we react or how we make decisions, etc. And it's so fascinating to watch and to learn because it explains you so many things, right? And then you apply them in more or less in everyday life. Yeah. In everything. Okay. Anything, what else would you say in regards to like painting the vivid picture through the words is also something. Okay. Is, is it now the moment to talk about the, my John, my, my uh, friend, John technique? Sure. Because that is, yeah. <laughs> what, what was your takeaway from that before I, uh, Go so, into it. yeah, so cor- again, correct me if I'm wrong, even when back then, when I heard it, I was like, okay, let me, let me go back here because I'm not sure, not sure I really understood what you are, what you are saying. So correct me if I'm wrong here, because I really and want to know the truth here and I be, want to be correct here. Um, what I understand when you are talking with Mark is that when we are telling a story, it's way better for us to present the story that we want to share from someone else's point of view, more or less, meaning that it didn't happen to me or to the audience, but to someone else. Because when we present it as something that happened to someone else, we don't judge or we don't feel like you explained it very well back then. Um, am, am I correct up until here? Or yeah, not? you bet. So if, okay. if we're trying to communicate something that might be sensitive or emotional, okay. if we communicate to other people that it happened to someone else, yeah. it's removed from the situation. So if I'm describing me in first person yeah. experiencing a car crash, yeah, then then you are having to imagine that more vividly. Okay. And if I'm explaining somebody else getting into a car crash, it's easier to distance yourself from it. So what I do by saying my friend did this or my friend said this is it takes it out of the context from you and me. Okay. And then it makes it easier for your mind to automatically accept it. Because if I'm telling you something about me and I'm looking at you, your, your conscious mind is screening it and filtering it to make sure that everything makes sense for you. If I take it out of this context and I'm talking about someone else, it's your brain is, is not on the defensive because I'm talking about something that's not involving you and me. So the brain is more likely to accept imaginary information. I'm talking about uh, another person, or it's more like it's less likely to scrutinize it or check it and make sure that everything is okay for it to accept. Yeah. So how was that? How was that researched? Like, do you know? Like, how did that? Like, how did we find that? Now, the first person that I've seen in research using it was in the 1930s, and her name was Virginia Satir. She was a therapist. Okay. And she kind of passed this technique down to Milton Erickson, who's a famous hypnotherapist. Okay. And he used it quite a bit, but it's a great way to soften anything. So if, if I have a cable guy, the, the guy who runs my satellite TV here at the house, and I want to criticize the cable company. Yeah. Or I want to criticize the job that these guys do at the house. It's it's one thing for me to say, "Hey, I don't like this," or "Hey, this is this is crappy." But it's, what you have done is crappy. Right? Yeah. So it's another thing for me to say, you know, my friend said that people come over to his house all the time and don't do X, Y, and Z. So now I'm removing it from me. Yeah. So now that the negative energy of that is is dispersed into an imaginary person. By the way, do you, but that is a technique that of course it can be used, but is there, a, is there a moment where you still prefer to present, let's say something that happened to you or to a friend, not to you from your point, like from first person, right? From, from, and not going in what happened to a friend of mine or a friend of mine went through whatever, whatever. Like do, do you as the presenter sometimes still use first person tell the story of what happened to you, for example, or you always yeah, go in absolutely. that. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So 
so how do you differentiate like how do you take the decision okay I'll, for this story i'm for example going to use first person for this one i'm going to present it through the my friend john technique or whatever it's called so if i'm telling a story about myself and i want them to imagine it that's fine i'll, t- I'll talk about that but if i want okay. them to really feel a certain emotions so okay. i want them to i want them to get really focused on what i'm saying up there on the stage i will talk about my friend going to golf lessons or i'll even say it about me and from the stage i'm typically never using the my friend john technique unless okay. it's something something negative okay so, That's so, but i'll i'll put that language into my speech you know i'm saying like something is is fascinating it's easy to just become completely focused when something captures all of your attention so i will I will use that language. I'll describe the process of becoming focused as I'm speaking from the stage. And it really helps people are imagining that process because I'm using more sensory language. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting stuff. 30 plus minutes already gone by. Very, <laughs> very interesting. So if you, if you have to go and say, okay, so you have to deliver a training or you have to deliver a one hour keynote or a presentation, let's go maybe my question will be a bit basic here but let's see where it goes um how do you prepare like having all those all that knowledge in regards to non-verbal influence etc how do you prepare for a presentation like what are your what do you do for in order to make sure that you are going to go on stage and deliver for that client and move the audience to that new world to point b where you want them to go like what do you, do you have like a checklist, let's say, of things that you do? Yeah, so I will, uh, there's a couple of things I do to prepare. Okay. I never prepare the information, which some people will need to. And, and, you know, there's different types of speaking that some people need to go do some research. I could, okay. I could be called to do a, a five-hour speech right now and I could stand up and do it without any notes or anything. Yeah. So, but that's because you have done the research already and correct. you live and breathe it, right? Yeah, I've got the, okay. the 10,000 hour rule, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of my other preparation is to look up some of those people on LinkedIn. So okay. as many people as I possibly can, I'm going to look them up on LinkedIn. Okay. I'm going to figure out what Meaning from the audience, you mean? From the audience, yes. Okay, okay. And when we talk about it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up somebody's profile. Most of us would say, I'm going to look at how they describe themselves, their little descriptions. Okay. I'm going to look at their image to see what kind of a person they are. Are they wearing a suit and all that kind of stuff? But that's not the place to look. Okay. The place you want to look to develop a profile of your audience is look up six or seven of those people's LinkedIn profiles who you know are going to be there. And you go straight to the section where they have given reviews or recommendations to other people. Okay, why? Right under there, people will tend to give praise to other people that they would like to receive themselves. So what this means is I'm going to go to this guy's page. I'm going to go right down to the recommendations part. I'm going to click on given what recommendations this person is given. And I'm going to look at the language that they use. Do they communicate about how much they help the team? Do they communicate about money? Do they communicate about how significant and successful somebody is? So I'm going to get a, I'm going to get an idea of what type of people these are by looking at three or four of these things. So what, what words do they use when they compliment other people? Because that's the words they need to hear themselves. Okay. That is interesting. And, and next, I'm going to figure out what is the most high impact information I can possibly give. And right at the beginning of, of any speech, I'm going to start with, like, what is the most shocking thing that I could probably tell this audience? Yeah. Because I need, if I don't get focused within the first 30 seconds, I'm done. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting a call back. They're not going to call me back. And if, if I don't close really well. I'm, they're not going to call me back. So how am I going to close? My opening and my close are the most important Critical. parts yeah. because of two psychological principles called the primacy effect and the, and the recency. recency. Yeah. Okay. So they'll remember the beginning and the end more than the middle. 
So those are okay. the things I need to make sure I've got dead on, which, which I do most of the time anyway, automatically. But I want to make sure that it's clear to that audience. Yeah. That I've structured it to that audience. And, and finally, self-management is incredibly important. Okay. What do you mean that, by self-management? That middle part of our brain, that animal brain, is like 10 to 100 million years old. Okay. And it's, it's been reading body language for a long time because language didn't exist until recently in our species history. Yeah. Mm. So we were born knowing how to read body language. We were born with behaviors. That's why a baby can smile and frown and laugh. All of those yeah. things are genetic memory. Language mm -hmm. is not a genetic memory. We yeah. do not pass down language. Yeah. So that audience, whether or not you communicate well is going to give them a feeling because they're reading your behavior and they'll judge you within the first few seconds of conversation. Yeah. And the, the way, like the last time you had a conversation with somebody who their body language was great, their communication was fantastic. The, there's some, we've all had an experience where we've had a conversation that went really well, but something in our gut, something in our intuition told us something is not right. Yeah. And that experience comes from that mammalian part of our brain. Since mm. it can't speak English, it can't talk to us. Yeah. And we can't, it can't logically speak to us. It has to give us a feeling. Mm. And that's where that comes from. So the moment that you walk up on stage, you've got your suit on, you've got a nice tie on, you've got your lapel mic adjusted perfectly, your hair is done. Everything looks great. Yeah. But back at home... You, you look like a million bucks on the stage, but back at home, you've got a sink full of dishes. You haven't done your laundry for two weeks. Your brain, <laughs> okay. your brain knows damn well that you're faking it. Yeah. So no matter how much you have worked on your own behavior, your own body language, your body will betray you. And no, nobody no. in the audience is going to say, oh, he's got a stack of dishes or he hasn't paid his bills in a long time. They're not going to know that. They'll get the feeling from their, yeah. their mammal brain that something doesn't add up. Yeah. And we can't hide it. So just making your bed will show on stage. Whether or not you pay your bills on time will show on stage. And whether or not you're able to manage yourself, that really goes through to other people. And they do see. And that's see what it. you mean by yeah. self-managing. Yeah. So it's wow. it's one of those things where that does bleed in and people get a subconscious feeling about you. They can't put their finger on it. They don't know what it is because that part of our brain doesn't speak English. They don't know what it is, but they get a feeling like, yeah, it was, it was a great speech, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll get somebody else next year. Maybe we'll get somebody else to teach us next time when we, mm. when we hire a speaker. I don't know why, but I just got a feeling about that person. I don't know why. I just didn't like him very much. Yeah, that is. And that's where that comes from. Yeah, that is very, very, very interesting. That is on, I would say, I don't know if it will be correct to say, this is, this is, this is such on a low level, such a low level thing, and yet has such a big impact on the end result. Yeah, huge impact. Huge impact, yeah. So, by the way, that, what you said about the audience and how do you research, for example, on LinkedIn or whatever, is something that's very interesting because obviously when we are, what we also do is most of, most of our projects start with when we are building presentations because part, partially what we do is 50% of our businesses, we build the presentations for our clients and we work with them to deliver them, etc. But we work, we work on the story, then we have a design team, they create some stunning visuals and motion stuff like that and the other 50 is the trainings and in both of those cases you have an audience right and we always advise hey who is the audience and many times we you will be surprised I, no you particularly you maybe won't be surprised because you probably have heard someone saying when you ask him so who is your audience and they say well we cannot know it's a conference and everyone can buy a ticket right i don't know if you have heard something like this but that level of resistance because for me, correct me here, but when I ask some, someone something and when they hear me asking that question and 
hear that they haven't done the needed effort and now they they probably need to do that effort that is automatic resistance at least in my eyes because you are asking them to change and yeah. people do not like that to change yeah. that much at least that's how i see it but have you heard anything like this like people don't or say very openly that they cannot know or they don't know what the audience or who the audience will be yeah and experience. that's a that's a wonderful thing to say because I can help you with that too. Okay, let's go there. What do you do there? So let's say you're, you're booked to speak at an event. There's 800 people there and you're not going to go through 800 LinkedIn profiles. It would take no, you three po- not months. Not possible, right? Yeah, yeah not possible. Okay. You have no idea. Yeah. So you get on stage. The lights are super bright. Yeah, it's hard to see, see <laughs> anybody. Yeah, maybe the first table, you can see the first row or the first group of tables if you're speaking at a dinner event. Yeah. So what you're going to do is use those behavioral profiling skills from the very first few seconds. Right at the beginning, you're looking for people crossing their legs, people nodding their heads, people's mm-hmm. mouths being relaxed, and you're looking for that low blink rate. Okay. Anything that you say that causes those behaviors, you see people taking notes, nodding their heads, crossing their legs, Uh, holding their face like they're very interested, tilting their head as indicating curiosity. Those are the areas that you expound upon. And the moment, the moment that you say something that makes several of those people start blinking faster, uncross their legs, stop taking notes, put their pen down, look away, check their phone, stop Mm -hmm. talking about that immediately. Yeah. And change the subject. Yeah. Try another thing. (laughs) Yeah. And now within the first... Three, or five, three to five minutes, you do have a psychological profile of the audience. You just don't know what it is, but you know what they respond to. Yeah, yeah. But if you, if you, like, that is obviously an extreme case when you don't know the audience at all uh, for one or the other reason, right? But if you have to think about, obviously, you research your audience on LinkedIn, right? And you look at the testimonials what they have given, meaning that if they have given that feedback, they want to receive it in this way with the words that they're using, as you said, etc. By the way, why is that the case? Like, what is what is the psychology behind that? Well, we tend to happening, we tend to give the praise we want to receive. Okay, that's that's just the simplest answer there. But we, we tend to project onto other people, especially when we're doing positive qualities on the internet, okay. we're writing somebody a recommendation letter. We'll praise them with all the things that we like to be complimented on because that's what we think other people like. Okay. And yeah. if, if you're unable to profile your audience and you can't go on LinkedIn, you need to profile the person who hired you and the person who's going to hire you next and Door tailor your answers. speech. Yeah. Tailor your speech to the organizer yeah, because that's who's going to hire you. So go on the organizers, LinkedIn, look at every comment they make about other people. Do they say the word brilliant, amazing, interesting, fascinating? Those are the words that you need to be using in your speech. To resonate with them. Yes. Yeah. I, we always say that not always, but most of the times when we talk about how people and our students can find information about the audience, we always say, Hey guys, think about it. It's three, main channels and we always give examples with a few presentations that we turned upside down just because we understood who the audience was and the first one is like go on the web or go to the intranet because for example we turned a very critical presentation around in regards to the story itself the delivery itself because we found something about the jury because there was a jury in front of our client in the corporate intranet of the client and we saw a video with one of the the main person in the jury saying a few things and that was by the way Deloitte so it is a big customer and we just found wow. something on on the web or the intranet where you go on LinkedIn their website whatever and you just scan everything now I didn't know about I haven't thought about the testimonials but that is something that's very very interesting and for sure is a consideration especially if that person gave testimonials right Mm -hmm. because i think there will be some people who for some reason didn't give testimonials on linkedin for one reason or the other right Right. Uh, but but still you can get a lot of 
insights about who those people are from the web. The second yeah, channel I mean, is, yeah. Even if they're not, if they, if they don't have any testimonials, we look at what they comment on other people's, what exactly. words they use exactly. when they comment. Yeah, exactly. I, we, by the way, it is shocking when I see this. We, for example, found a quote. This was the a C-level executive in Lufthansa. You know Lufthansa for sure. Uh, so they were here in Bulgaria for a competition and one of our clients was pitching their project. And again, we just searched for his name on Google and on the second or I don't know what link we opened because we started opening all of the links which had his name on and we found a quote that he said and we saw that quote, what he said in an interview. And we were like, oh my God, he actually wants a product like the ones that our client provides. He And he said it publicly. And we asked ourselves, hey, how, how can we use that without it looking creepy, right? Because it <laughs> probably it can look <laughs> creepy also. But we yeah. created a yeah, we created a situation where our client actually goes to this moment very quickly, as you said, in the first 30 seconds. I believe even in the first 15 seconds, in in his talk and says, and a few months ago, somewhere here in the audience said the following: We are leaving you 10 seconds to read it. And he shuts up, right? And we monitor only the reaction of this person. How is he going to react? Is he going to smile or is he going? <laughs> and that, if you're asking me, we won, he won that award and the investment just because of that moment. Because in this moment, he created this very personal relationship with this person without even doing anything else. And that is just information on the web. And as, as you said, the conference organizers is the second channel that we also advise. And the third one, I don't know if that happened with you, but we had, again, with Deloitte, by the way, had a very interesting case where we found very interesting information for the audience through the network of the person who is the speaker, meaning his friends, colleagues, close oh, wow. people. Yeah, that was insane i mean we asked they refused us to give a, the we asked the organizers who is the jury they said it's forbidden it's against the rules for us to tell you and we're like okay you want to play hard okay so let's try to figure this out and we asked him can you ask the people who went through this who was the jury this is his network and we use his network and he asked the people in his network who went through this program who was in the jury and surprisingly, in the last few years, every single person who went through this program had the same jury in front of them. So wow. now we knew the names. And from there, we attacked the intranet and we found that video with the person and on and on and on and on it goes. But again, it's all about that, that audience, right? That you say, hey, spend the time. Do you, do you, how much time would you say you spent on analyzing your audience when you're about to give a speech or a training? Uh, at least a couple of hours. It, oh my God. Like that is, this is hope that is being recorded. So if you are doing that now, I'm going to play that to our clients and ask them, what is their, their excuse to not do that? Like you spent hours in that? At least a few hours. Imagine if, how if it's not, if it's not me, then it's my interns doing, doing the research. And they provide you with the summary or whatever. Yes. Okay. So it is super critical, you say? A hundred percent. It is everything. It is everything. Okay. So let's, let's end with one final tip on presenting because we are almost one hour in. One final, one final tip from you. Like what would you say will make the difference? We talked about a f at least five or six things that are very important, obviously. If we have to add one more, what would you say? Well, there's a whole lot, but I would say sure. <laughs> don't. That's why we're going to link the your, trainings for sure. Yeah. And I would, I would never stand behind a podium. Okay. Why? I think it is a fatal mistake that if a person, if a mammal, if a primate, a human being okay. is a primate, when we, when a primate cannot see the full body of another primate, we yeah. lose trust very quickly. And that's because. Like because why, why does it we, can't, we can't determine intent of another primate unless we can see their body. Okay. So if you're on stage and that and those people can't see your whole body, you're stuck behind a podium or you're yep. checking notes, then we lose trust. We're manufacturing mistrust. Okay. 
and doubt and uncertainty in, uh, in we, the people that are in the audience. We are manufacturing mistrust, meaning that we, by default, are pessimists for the intent. Yes. Okay, yeah. Because are, it's, it's survival, right? Or not? Yeah, it keeps us and safe, that, right? Yeah, and we want to see the whole body of, of people okay. that we don't know, especially people that we don't know. And that first few seconds up there is, is where, when they're going to sum you up. And if they have a negative belief of you from the beginning, the brain is only going to look for confirming evidence of their initial belief. And I'll say that yeah. again. Yeah. Their brain will continue to look for evidence of the con- initial belief. Even if evidence to the contrary is present, it's only looking for evidence to support their initial gut That's feeling insane. about you. Yeah, that is insane. So it is super critical to go in front, even if there is a lecture, uh, even if there is a, um, sorry, um, even if there is a, how did you call it? Uh, not podium. a lecture, but a podium. So yeah. E- even if there is something that's on the stage and you may need it 30 minutes in, right? It is better for you to go in front so that the whole audience sees your whole body in the first 30 seconds, yeah. right? And potentially at some point go back there to do a demo or to do something else and not vice versa, not stay there for the first 30 seconds and then go in front. Yeah, or stand beside it while you have to do your demo. Beside it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That is, ins- that is also insane. Wow. Okay, so we are linking for sure the online trainings. And I heard that, and we talked about the new book that you also wrote, which is called Phrase 7. Uh, where can people find that one? Yeah, that's my uh, first fiction book. I've, I've written a long time and I have to call it fiction for, for legal reasons. Okay. But the, the book is uh, about a secret society of people who are experts in persuasion and influence and kind of swing global events using that stuff. And it's just phrase7.com. Okay. So we are going to link that one also in, in the show notes afterwards. Um, I don't know. I think that we can continue talking about presentations and... <laughs> persuasion and influence i believe very very long maybe we can get you back on the podcast at some point in the future talking about to. something else yeah for sure that sounds great then so thank you for spending one hour uh, with me and the audience that's going to listen to this one probably in the next months or even a year who knows and thanks for sharing all that knowledge i believe even for me that was especially the blinking part i when you were talking about this I was already reminding myself every single time when, for example, I spoke at Ignite, which is the Microsoft's event at the US, I was thinking about the first few rows of people and how they were reacting, trying to figure out what happened there. (laughs) Let's see. Wow. (laughs) Trying to to understand what happened there. Did I, did, were they blinking very often? (laughs) On and on and on. I'm going for, for sure that thought is going to stick with me in the next few days. Uh, Very interesting idea there. I haven't thought about that at all. Uh, so thank you very much again for for being with us, for sharing all that knowledge, and hopefully we'll see you um, at some point again in the podcast, or maybe maybe why not join us here in Bulgaria for a workshop or a training or something like this. I believe that we there will be a lot of people who may be interested in uh, the things that you you can share. Yeah, Boris, I'd love to, man. I'd love to come out there. Sure. Okay. Let's let's try to figure that out, but let's first stop that virus thing somehow and then we'll figure out how you can come here to bulgaria and we can organize something for you and bring the audience there okay thanks for having me on boris appreciate it yeah thank you very much for staying with us and for being with us and yeah see you soon thanks all right here we are at the end of this amazing episode thanks again to chase for joining in and thank you everyone who listened and stay tuned There's surely a lot more to say about the topic of body language, nonverbal communication, etc. So let us know if you still have some questions or want to know more about the topic. And we'll be happy to figure this out. Uh, Just shoot us a message or comment on Facebook or Instagram or any other social platform for that matter. And we'll make sure we'll reply very, very quickly. 
Visit 356labs.com if you want to learn more about presentations and tell us who you want us to invite next for a future episode of the podcast. Again, thanks for listening. And in case you found this episode to be useful, subscribe to the podcast and why not even leave us a review on iTunes or, or share it with a friend. We would appreciate it. Thanks again and see you in the next one.